Dear Esther, the morning after I was washed ashore, salt in my ears, sand in my mouth, and the waves always at my ankles, I felt as though everything had conspired to this one last shipwreck. I remembered nothing but water, stones in my belly and my shoes, threatening to drag me under to where only the most listless of creatures swim. Donnelly reported the legend of the Hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claimed to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. There was once talk of a wind farm out here, away from the rage and the intolerance of the masses. The sea, they said, is too rough for the turbines to stand. They clearly never came here to experience the becalming for themselves. Personally, I would have supported it. Turbines would be a fitting contemporary refuge for a hermit. The revolution and the permanence. I have found the ship's manifest, crumpled and waterlogged under a stash of paint cans. It tells me that along with this present cargo, there was a large quantity of antacid yogurt bound for the European market. It must have washed out to sea. God knows there are no longer gulls or goats here to eat it.
A wonderful sight. The moon cresting the junction between the cliff path and the stone circle. It cast a shadow of the ridge across the beach, all the world as if you had signed your name in untidy handwriting. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boat, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. They were God-fearing people, those shepherds. There was no love in the relationship. Donnelly tells me that they had one Bible that was passed around in strict rotation. It was stolen by a visiting monk in 1776, two years before the island was abandoned altogether. In the interim, I wonder, did they assign chapter and verse to the stones and grasses, marking the geography with a superimposed significance that they could actually walk the Bible and inhabit its contradiction? Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. I threw my arms wide and the cliff opened out before me, making this rough home. I transferred my belongings from the bothy on the mount and tried to live here instead. It was cold at night and the sea lapped at the entrance at high tide. To climb the peak, I must first venture even deeper into the veins of the island, where the signals are blocked altogether. Only then will I understand them, when I stand on the summit and they flow into me, uncorrupted.
I've become convinced I'm not alone here, even though I'm equally sure it is simply a delusion brought upon by circumstance. I do not, for instance, remember where I found the candle, or why I took it upon myself to light such a strange pathway. Perhaps it is only for those who are bound to follow. Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses, and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anaesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape, and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. I've begun my ascent on the windless slope of the western side. The setting sun was an inflamed eye squeezing shut against the light shone in by the doctors. My neck is aching through constantly craning my head up to track the light of the aerial. I must look downwards, follow the path under the island to a new beginning. The Bothy was constructed originally in the early 1700s. By then, shepherding had formalized into a career. The first habitual shepherd was a man called Jacobsen from a lineage of migratory Scandinavians. 
He was not considered a man of breeding by the mainlanders. He came here every summer whilst building the Bothy, hoping eventually that becoming a man of property would secure him a wife and a lineage. Donnelly records that it did not work. He caught some disease from his malcontented goats and died two years after completing it. There was no one to carve white lines into the cliff for him either. Three cormorants seen at dusk, they did not land. This house built of stone, built by a long dead shepherd. Contents, my camp bed, a stove, a table, chairs, my clothes, my books. The caves that score out the belly of this island, leaving it famished. My limbs and belly, famished. This skin, these organs, this failing eyesight. When the battery runs out in my torch, I will descend into the caves and follow only the phosphorescence home. He left his body to the medical school and was duly opened out for a crowd of students 21 days after his passing. The report is included in my edition of his book. The syphilis had torn through his guts like a drunk driver, scrambling his organs like eggs on a plate. But enough definition remained for a cursory examination, and, as I suspected, they found clear evidence of a kidney stone. He's likely to have spent the last years of his life in considerable pain. Perhaps this is the root of his laudanum habit. Although its use makes him an unreliable witness, I find myself increasingly drawn into his orbit. They found Jakobsen in early spring. The thaw had only just come. Even though he'd been dead nearly seven months, his body had been frozen right down to the nerves and had not even begun to decompose. His fingernails were raw and bitten to the quick found the phosphorescent moss that grows in the caves deep under the nails. Whatever he'd been doing under the island when his strength began to fail is lost. He'd struggled halfway up the cliff again, perhaps in a delirium, perhaps trying to reach the Bothy's fire before curling into a stone and expiring. Climbing down to the caves, I slipped and fell and have injured my leg. I think the femur is broken. It is clearly infected. The skin has turned a bright, tight pink, and the pain is crashing in on waves, winter tides against my shoreline, drowning out the ache of my stones. I struggled back to the bothy to rest, but it has become clear that there is only one way this is likely to end. The medical supplies I looted from the trawler have suddenly found their purpose. They will keep me lucid for my final ascent. Did Jakobsen crawl this far? Can I identify the scratches his nails ruined into the rocks? Am I following him cell for cell, inch for inch? Why did he turn back on himself and not carry through to the ascent?
It was as if someone had taken the car and shaken it like a cocktail. The glove compartment had been opened and emptied with the ashtrays and the boot. It made for a crumpled museum, a shattered exhibition. If the caves are my guts, this must be the place where the stones are first formed. The bacteria phosphoresce and rise, singing through the tunnels. Everything here is bound by the rise and fall, like a tide. Perhaps the whole island is actually underwater.
When I was coming round from the operation, I remember the light they shone in my eyes to check for pupil contraction. It was like staring up at a moonlit sky from the bottom of a well. People moved at the summit, but I could not tell if you were one of them. I wish I could have known Donnelly in this place. We would have had so much to debate. Did he paint these stones or did I? Who left the pots in the hut by the jetty? Who formed the museum under the sea? Who fell silently to his death into the frozen waters? Who erected this godforsaken aerial in the first place? Did this whole island rise to the surface of my stomach, forcing the gulls to take flight?
I returned home with a pocket full of stolen ash. Half of it fell out of my coat and vanished into the car's upholstery. But the rest I carefully stowed away in a box I kept in a drawer by the side of my bed. It was never intended as a meaningful act, but over the years it became a kind of talisman. I'd sit still, quite still for hours, just holding the diminishing powder in my palm and noting its smoothness. In time, we will all be worn down into granules, washed into the sea and dispersed. Hall, by the roadside, by the exit for Damascus, all ticking and cooled, all feathers and remorse, all of these signals rooted like traffic through the circuit diagrams of our guts, those badly ridden boats torn bottomless in the swells, washing us forever ashore. From here, I can see my armada. I collected all the letters I'd ever meant to send to you, if I'd have ever made it to the mainland, but had instead collected at the bottom of my rucksack, and I spread them out along the lost beach. Then I took each and every one, and I folded them into boats. I folded you into the creases, and then, as the sun was setting, I set the fleet to sail. Shattered into 21 pieces, I consigned you to the Atlantic, and I sat here until I'd watched all of you sink. When Paul keeled over dead on the road to Damascus, they resuscitated him by hitting him in the chest with stones gathered by the roadside. He was lifeless for 21 minutes, certainly long enough for the oxygen levels in his brain to have decreased and caused hallucinations and delusions of transcendence. I'm running out of painkillers, and the moon has become almost unbearably bright.
I've begun my voyage in a paper boat without a bottom. I will fly to the moon in it. I've been folded along a crease in time, a weakness in the sheet of life. Now you've settled on the opposite side of the paper to me. I can see your traces in the ink that soaks through the fiber, the pulped vegetation. When we become waterlogged and the cage disintegrates, we will intermingle. When this paper aeroplane leaves the cliff edge and carves parallel vapor trails in the dark, we will come together. If only Donnelly had experienced this, he would have realized he was his own shoreline, as am I. Just as I am becoming this island, so he became his syphilis, retreating into the burning synapses, the stones, the infection. Bent back like a nail, like a hangnail, like a drowning man clung onto the wheel, drunk and spiraled, washed onto the lost shore under a moon as fractured as a shattered wing. We cleave, we are flight and suspended, these wretched painkillers, this form inconstant. I will take flight, I will take flight. He was not drunk, Esther. He was not drunk at all. He had not drunk with Donnelly or Spat Jacobson back at the sea. He had not careered across the lost shores and terminal beaches of this nascent archipelago. He did not intend his bonnet to be crumpled like a spent tissue by the impact. His windscreen was not star-studded all over like a map of the heavens. His paintwork etched with circuit diagrams, strange fish to call the gulls away. The phosphorescence of the skid marks lighting the M5 all the way from Exeter to Damascus. run out of places to climb. I will abandon this body and take to the air. Dear Esther, I have burnt my belongings, my books, this death certificate. Mine will be written all across this island. Who was Jacobson? Who remembers him? Donnelly has written of him, but who was Donnelly? Who remembers him? 
I have painted, carved, hewn, scored into this space all that I could draw from him. There will be another to these shores to remember me. I will rise from the ocean like an island without bottom, come together like a stone, become an aerial, a beacon, that they will not forget you. You've always been drawn here. One day the gulls will return and nest in our bones and our history. I will look to my left and see Esther Donnelly flying beside me. I will look to my right and see Paul Jacobson flying beside me. They will leave white lines carved into the air to reach the mainland, where help will be sent. <laughs>